Okay, so welcome everyone to the second weekly conversation of Kai Work, the Symposium on Human Computer Interaction for Work. Um, today we have Max Wilson from the University of Nottingham in the UK as a guest. But before I give him his full introduction, let me tell you a bit about Kai Work. Um, there's, in this series, we're going to have weekly conversations with experts on various aspects of the future of work. Uh, the general chairs are Andrew Coonan and Orit Shear, and the technical programme chairs are Chris Janssen, Nehal Kumar, and Helena Mentis, and myself. We also have a really fantastic team of volunteers that are helping to create this series, and you can find out more about them and also about the series itself um, on our website, which is kaiwork.org. And on our website, you'll also find a link to register for this series. And if you do that, we will send you information about the talks and also calendar invitations, which will have links to the um, to Zoom for each of the sessions. Um, and we promise not to inundate you with the email. So you'll get about one a week, just as a reminder. So this series is partially supported by the National Science Foundation. And uh, today's format will include a 30 minute conversation with Max um, and then 30 minute, um, another 30 minutes in which we will just have a kind of free discussion. Um, that first 30 minutes will include questions from the audience and those questions will be handled by Chris Janssen today. So please put your questions in the chat and we'll call on you um, when Max and I have stopped chatting um, so that you can ask your questions yourself. Um, right, so let's get started talking to Max. So um, Max Wilson is an Associate Professor at the University of Nottingham in the Mixed Reality Lab, where he heads the Brain Data Group. And his research focuses, amongst other things, on understanding and measuring mental workload in experiences in HCI both through qualitative engagements with people and quantitatively using brain measures. So particularly looking at functional near-infrared spectroscopy, I find that really hard to say. Um, and we'll be talking about some of that work today. Um, Max is also deputy editor for IJHCS and a member of the CHI steering committee. So he's known by lots of us, I think, through those sorts of roles. So, Max, shall we start off? Um, why don't you tell us a bit about why you think the future of work is like a cognitive problem? Sure. Um, so there seems to be several angles which are kind of all lining up together to encourage the fact that more and more work that people do is becoming kind of more cognitively challenging and more cognitively tiring uh, than physical. And that's showing in things like the manufacturing industry where they're getting more automation and they're getting more robotic tools and uh, support that way such that they're doing, the people who are doing that work are increasingly doing kind of monitoring activities uh, rather than heavy lifting or direct manual work. Uh, and so it becomes you know, more cognitively complex to track what needs to be done in every task and make sure the systems are working properly rather than physically tiring. And we find that well, I'm sure lots of people who are here are used to having a pretty busy full on day. And then when I get to the end of the day and I'm tired, it's not because I've been running around lots or been doing physically tiring activities, but juggling all the aspects of this type of work uh, mixed with all the confusing things of raising a teenager and uh, organizing the household you know, together. They're all like vying for our time, vying for our mental workload to to like get done <laughs> and we're we're struggling I think well I find myself struggling to think you know how much break should I take should I spend an extra half hour doing this now um I've got a big deadline coming up and, and I, I probably overburn myself in terms of work and I'm looking forward to a holiday soon yeah not long till your holiday I think <laughs> so um so you mentioned there this idea about mental workload what what made you kind of interested in that rather than looking at something like um, like work-related stress, for example? Sure. So originally I um, I was working when I was doing my PhD and just after my PhD, I was interested in uh, browsing systems for information. So 
things like online retail stores and we were making all these features for, for searching for information and people would look at it and would be like, you know, what should I do? And I realized that what we were building was something that was hard for people to use, like complex to understand. And uh, I began to want to measure uh, whether design changes, simple design changes can uh, reduce mental workload while trying to you know, achieve a task with this information system. And I wanted to be able to prove that one design was easier to use than another that way. Um, so that's how I got into measuring mental workload. I started trying to measure people doing tasks with a brain scanner and showing that it would work with HCI methods like think aloud protocol that I wouldn't disrupt taking brain measurements too much. But part of your question there is about like, why not stress? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So why yeah. did you do that rather than something else? So one thing we found that's kind of interesting looking at mental workloads uh, is that it's, I guess, a little bit less like, um, of uh, maybe, uh, maybe emotional is the right answer or like a, a response to workload. So workload, mental workload is what you're doing, how much effort you're putting in. And what we found more often than not is that stress is how people feel about doing that workload. Um, so they are certainly interrelated and there's an interesting model, which is the transactional model of stress, which some people may have seen. And that shows that um, the experience of stress is when people see the amount of demand they have of work to do. And they're judging A, you know, whether or not they can realistically do it and B, what the consequences of not being able to do it. And at that point, that's when stress responses kick in. Um, but for sure, people like regularly like mix these up conceptually or just consider them quite related. And that's just because they are quite related. We have a, a paper on this specific topic, stress versus mental workload, which I, well, is quite a lot of data to get in, in one go, but that transactional model is where we focused for that. Okay, so um, you mentioned there, like talking about your work, how you've been getting people to wear this sort of brain scanners. Um, do you think that in the future we're all going to be wearing these whilst we're working? That's a good question. Um, so actually probably not. Well, it's hard to say. In some ways people can actually buy these personal brain like a uh, neurotechnology now. So you can get like a Muse headset with an app for just like a couple of hundred dollars and people are using it to meditate or focus. And there's a range of similar uh, bits of technology that people are buying and it was in the news actually recently I don't know whether people saw it it certainly hit the UK news where they were looking at sports professionals uh, who were being asked to use these muse headsets in order to meditate and relax prior to training or prior to uh, events sports events so it's quite interesting that we're seeing people a choose to buy them for themselves but also professional environments requesting people wear them Having said that though, we're mainly using a brain scanner because that's what I'm saying is good scientific objective data to measure a phenomenon that's happening so that we can then design technology to help people in the future. But I don't necessarily think people will want to wear brain scanners all the time. Although I've got a new one, which is kind of cool. This little headset looks like ram's horns when you put them on, it just kind of goes up here. So, I mean, they're getting kind of stylish and kind of fun. And the idea of this one is that it like um, it helps you sustain flow with work. I haven't played with it too much yet, but it will tell you when you're being distracted and will encourage you to focus. Uh, so we'll, we shall see. But lots of mental workload has like physiological responses like breathing and skin response. So there's, I think it's also possible in the future, just our Apple watches or other watches will tell us a bit more, you know, your skin looks like you're stressed or your skin looks like you're working hard. Yeah. So I think we'll start to see this type of personal data coming through in the future. So um, that system you're just talking about kind of gives you real time feedback on some aspect of your activity. And in one of your studies, I think you looked at kind of exactly doing this, sort of giving people this kind of immediate feedback. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. So we um. I guess the most common application of mental workload theory is uh, to work on something like safety critical tasks like air traffic control, where they're trying to maximize the amount that people can handle 
but they're trying to make sure people don't reach the point where they can't handle the amount of work they have to do because at that point there's lives are at risk if people start to make mistakes coordinating planes so the kind of standard um scenario for measuring mental workload is that you get people to do a task like air traffic control if not with actually with air traffic controllers and you uh, monitor like every 30 seconds what their mental workload is traditionally they would ask people to say out loud on a scale of five what their mental workloads uh, is and that's the isa scale if people are interested um and then use that as feedback to help manage people what we did is we we wanted to know if we could do this in real time now which is kind of what technology is beginning to let us do to some extent we can start to identify mental workload changes using physiological responses um we want to know if we showed people you know your mental workload is reaching a limit or it's increasing you know what will you do now so this is what i think is the interesting hci questions as to how people will behave knowing what their current mental workload is especially if they are so focused on a task that they're not not realizing or not acknowledging that they're reaching a limit and they should stop or they should hand over to someone else um so what we did is we had this system that was using our fnis data and it was shining a big red light at them when they had high mental workload uh, and one thing i should have predicted which we didn't predict is that this of course stresses people out <laughs> if not directly increases their mental workload really like your workload is high do something about it what we thought people would do is they would um use features like uh sending planes and patterns to delay work that they had to do so they could manage their mental workload and i think we would see that happen more with experienced people but in the novice user group that we studied we didn't see them actually managing to adapt their behavior or know what they could do effectively to manage their mental workload but yeah i'm really interested to know what people think of knowing their own mental workload so in that study did they was there like zero feedback and then all of a sudden there's a red flash thing? Yes, yes, exactly that. <laughs> it was quite interesting. We tried reversing it for a while so that the light in the room was red and then it flashed white when they had high mental workload. So we, halfway through the study, we realized we had to intervene and adjust our protocol to examine a different condition. And we did see some minor changes from that, you know, slightly less scary, but it was still, still a, yeah, it's probably not the best way to tell people <laughs> that they have high workload is, is make them worry more. And one thing that's interesting about stress while, while I'm there is um, we found some people really enjoyed that task. And they really enjoyed doing the air traffic control task, which was essentially a computer game, really, and had high mental workload, enjoyed it. And some people had high mental workload and really reported that they felt stressed by trying to do it, even though it was, you know, a user study in a HCI lab in a university and not with any real planes. They it, that was their experience was that it was stressful having a high workload and do you so do you think the system gave them an insight that they didn't have already um in that specific situation that's a good question actually i'm not sure i've thought about that for that study um they would certainly get feedback when a plane crashed <laughs> yeah. um, whether or not they were so self-aware that they could see that they were building up to a point where they were going to have a problem like they were creating a queue um but it's yeah i think it was interesting for people to to at least know and deal with it being warned that way and to be honest our, our technology that we have at that especially what we had at that point and what we still have now is relatively naive at being able to predict high workload so mm -hmm. it was more to do with how they would respond to the feedback yeah okay and then and so i suppose like thinking about the future of these sorts of systems like would they do you, is your vision for it sort of like something that tells you what your workload level is at all points in the day so it's something that you might wear continuously um and it will kind of give you this constant feedback or do you kind of imagine that it's something you might only wear for a short period and then kind of learn from that and then kind of give up wearing it? I think there's a, that's a really great question. And that's where most of my effort is going at the moment in terms of research. I'm interested, um, so we had a workshop paper a few years ago at the Kai Health uh, workshop that was around Kai. And um, we called it a Fitbit for the Brain because that's where we were starting our thinking at that point and where we've continued to do work since. Because we're interested in knowing 
presumably people could mo like monitor this all day or have access to a day's worth of records about what their day was like, which is probably more likely than kind of instant checking. Um, then what would they do with that information? And almost more importantly, you know, how would you show that to them? Um, so the first question is, you know, what are their goals? For me as a, a busy person, what I'm trying to do is figure out the optimum balance of uh, working at work, taking breaks at work, doing a bit of work in the evening, maybe uh, sleeping properly and knowing the impact of those things on being able to sustain high mental workloads uh, to reach my goals. Um, but there's probably other people in all sorts of situations that have different strategies for mental workload. Uh, we've been doing some work with people with Alzheimer's and a lot of the time what they're interested in is avoiding being cognitively sedentary. So they probably have their uh, opposite goal and that is to make sure they are not reaching a consistent low level but have something active on a regular basis that they're doing. Uh, and likewise, the, there might be some people who are trying to improve their work-life balance with it. You know? So these, these are the big sort of strategy questions with what you would do with knowing your mental workload. But we also don't really know what like, we would show people because it's not like we can count steps like a Fitbit. Like you, you've done 10,000 mental steps today. I don't know if that's a, a realistic thing we could try and segment up at some point in the future with, with some sort of effort. So we're doing a lot of um, conceptual discussions with people. Some people feel like it's a, a balloon which is stressed. And so it's good to have the balloon full of air, but if it maintains to be you know, too tight for a long period, it's gonna damage the balloon is, is how some people have described it. Um, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because there's sort of that, that group of people who might be people who are working, who might want to think about spreading out those high workload tasks or limiting how much of a particular day is spent engaged in those sorts of things. But then like the way you talk about the people with Alzheimer's, it's almost sounds like they're thinking of it as exercise. Yeah. Um, I, I can remember my grandmother saying that she wanted to play puzzle games to keep her mind active. And she kind of felt like this was a useful activity. So it's, it's really interesting thinking about those different user groups and their different needs. Because I think with physical activity trackers, for example, there's been less attention given to the different needs of different groups. Um, but I think uh, now we seem to have some questions in the chat, so I'll hand over to Chris. Cool. Sure. Yeah, there's multiple, so uh, we, we have lots to go through. Um, <clears throat> I think based on, on where the conversation was heading, actually, I'm going to skip to Diana's question. Uh, as that's most related about context of use, which which seems to be what what we were getting towards. So, Diana, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Yeah. So, I, I wonder how this technology compares to just using a good old therapy that could help you um, be more in tune with your body and regulate it, like using grounding techniques, for example, when you get so anxious. Um, how does this technology kind of um, work with those techniques, maybe work against it, actually, because I, I, I don't know how I'd feel about a piece of technology telling me, hey, this is how you feel um, based on your biometric right. data. Um, and not that that's a bad thing, because it is hard to understand how uh, your body is feeling. But I wonder if we're sort of uh, taking that agency away from people. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the second point you mentioned about how people feel about being told by the technology what they're doing. We did have some participants in a recent study talk about that because they were they were kind of annoyed in a way that it would somehow classify them against what could be, you know, a, a normal a norm across, you know, all people. And that has things to say about neurodiversity and things like that, which might, you know, might be bad for people if they're compared inaccurately to some meaningless norm um but yeah i imagine the te kind of technology will be just like a self data tracking aspect for people so a bit like when a fitness coach is uh, is telling people they should be doing you know some more some more runs or try to increase some different activities swim a bit differently or faster or longer then people will take they take kind of measurements about themselves doing those exercises so they've got like a way of knowing they're doing better or worse 
I think it would be a nice compliment. I would love to actually study this in the future um, for people who have been given advice from therapists, for example, on what they should do to be more in tune with themselves and then to see whether or not they can use this type of technology uh, to help understand whether they're doing that right or not. Um, I can easily imagine like these professionals in the sports industry who are asking their, their players to meditate with a Muse app, for example. I can see them, this being like a common thing where they're, they're saying, you know, track, track your day for a day and see where your highest effort is and for how long your highest mental workload lasts uh, and see if you can balance that in your next day. So I think it will complement. Cool. Um, we've been thinking a lot about high mental workload and claimants, you were thinking about the other ends. Uh, can you elaborate on your question a bit? I mean, I, I think we touched it a bit. Um, like we said, like uh, for elderly people doing uh, puzzles all the time to keep up their their performance level. But when you we talk a lot about um, automation and when you're getting low levels, then your um, ability to react to bad events uh, diminishes its head. And there is much work on that. Did you now you're you kind of want to actively influence workloads? Did you? Do any experiments on trying to improve work or improve performance by increasing workload rather than reducing it? It's a really good question. So yeah, you're right. A lot of the time, the effort in research is to reduce mental workload for doing the same task or be able to do more task with the maintained level of mental workload. But there is definitely a low workload situation, especially with automation, like you said. Um, which I think is where mental workload relates to vigilance. Um, and vigilance is interesting on two ends of the scale because one is you're doing such hard work for a sustained amount of time that you, you, know, you need lots of vigilance to stay alert for a long time doing hard work. We've seen people trying to do 45 minutes of intense uh, quality checking being quite challenging for people. Um, but at the other end, when it comes to like uh, autonomous vehicles and driving, then the vigilance there is to not, not be distracted you know, from something that's so boring and uninvolved for a long period of time. And that's where people make mistakes at the lower end of mental workload. So the graph, in one of the theories of mental workload, the graph is um, the performance drops at both very low workload and then at the level that's too high for you, end of the scale for workload. Um, the year but I don't know slow, that. <laughs> so I wasn't sure about the last bit of your question there, like whether or not people have got better through lower workloads. Is that what you said? No, uh, I tried to ask if you have done any actual um, experiments on how to maybe improve performance by increasing workload mm. in some the, way by some artificial task or something like that. Um, it's a good question. I haven't directly thought about that, but I will think about it. But I think it's, it's to me, that's your question is about um, manage it. if you can manage your day better would you get more performance out of it is that what you mean or specifically yeah, maybe maybe task? even you said like meditation right you're trying to you're doing something actively maybe that doesn't actually reduce your vigil or your vigilance level but rather uh, increase it because you're kind of activating your mind rather than just sleeping mm -hmm. or something like that so that might be uh, an interesting way to think about it yeah, that is interesting. Thank you. There's uh, two more questions that are <clears throat> slightly different, but they're they're all about sort of clarifying, well, what are we actually talking about? So these are often the most difficult questions because you have to be a bit more precise. Um, but feel free to wing it, Max. Um, okay. That uh, Hiba is asking, um, how do we know that mental workload is actually due to the work and not due to something else. So that's maybe maybe one side, but before we even get to that question, uh, Geraldine was also uh, inquiring sort of to clarify, well, what what do we mean with the load of loads? Maybe Geraldine, you can phrase it way better than, than I can. Uh, at least in the text, it's already way better phrased than, than I have said it. Thing if, thing if my camera is working. No, it's not. And I've, Anyway, I don't know what's wrong with the camera. Um, I thought I'd tried to fix it. Um, yeah, so I don't, as I said, it's ill-formed. And I think it's the same problem I have with lots of the measurement, you know, the physiological measures 
which is seductive because we can get this objective data and sexy graphs and everything. And mm -hmm. it's the sense making of it and it's the more holistic understanding of it that I grapple with. So I'm just, I was just thinking that I could be experiencing a, a, you know, or be measured as having a high mental workload. But if it's something that I really care about, that I'm passionate about and that I want to do, there's there's an energy around it, even if it might be a little bit exhausting. But if it's a high mental workload doing something that's really dredge work, um, that might, would it look the same? Would it measure the same? And, you know, like I just, I just wonder about that more holistic integrative interpretation in a, in sort of an embodied, um, engaged sense. Yeah, for sure. It's um, definitely interesting. So I think it would, in terms of physiological data, which is definitely, you know, often conflated by fatigue and stress and things like that, you're, you're for sure going to get a messy uh, reading on what, you're, what the physiological data you're measuring says. But you're right, absolutely, that there is good mental workload that you enjoy and then your energy for something uh, is likely to increase your capacity is what the theory says for the mental workload. So. Um, there's a in one of the diagrams for mental workload there's like a wiggly line of your maximum capacity at the top um which you're approaching in terms of mental workload and that wiggly line is a mixture of factors between you know alertness caffeinatedness <laughs> um uh how how good your sleep was the day before and things like that so they acknowledge that, that there's both you know longer term factors that will affect your ability to have sustained high workload and almost momentary uh experiences of it that if, you know your, your enjoyment of it increases the amount you're willing to engage with it but i think in the end it would it would measure the same because your enjoyment or lack of enjoyment of something would probably measure differently but you're right you would need that context in an app i guess or in your reflections to think about it so so i guess this partially ties to heba's question uh, Heba, if you're still here, maybe maybe you can ask it yourself, but it is about, I guess, from an experimental perspective about exerting control over what you measure. But of course, in, in HCI settings, we don't always have full control over the, over the context and what we measure. Um, but maybe uh, Heba, I, I see Heba still here, but maybe they can ask it way better than I do. So feel free to, to take part. Hi, sorry, I didn't realize my camera was off. Um, I was just wondering when Max was explaining about, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> when he was explaining uh, the things about his experiment uh, with the air traffic controllers, like when we were measuring the mental workload, can you really tell that it, like the stress level is actually measuring the workload and not, you know, something really irrelevant, their stress because, you know, a family member is going through something or like, they're having a bad day or something. And that's why their stress is, you know, I'm really interested in that part. If you can really identify that the stress they're having is because of the, the work they're doing. Yeah, really good question. Um, so what we would do in experiments, I guess, is compare it to a baseline point where it's the same person, same day, and you've got uh, their levels when they're not doing something that's a high mental workload task and then we're comparing it to when they do have a high mental workload task. But um, you're right that there's all these contextual factors. In one of our more recent studies, we, um, we, we spoke to someone who was really uh, stressed out in their personal life because of an ill family member. And that, that was saying they were, it was taking away their general capacity for sustaining high mental workload. They weren't able to focus on things that, that day because they were so worried. Um, so when it comes to this Fitbit for the brain future that I think we have, uh, it's going to have to, to some extent, allow people to comprehend what's going on in their life and how that's affecting their ability. And it might reveal something interesting to them about it. I often speak to students who are uh, grieving in our university because I'm on part of the welfare team. And uh, I say to them, you know, if you're grieving right now, that's going to seriously affect your, your ability to focus and study. And they say, oh, no, no, it's, it's fine. You know, it's obviously sad, but I've got nothing to do for two weeks. Uh, 
until like there's maybe a family gathering so I should be able to focus but really I, they, they almost don't believe me when I tell them that it's actually going to be really limiting on their ability to focus and work and I think this type of data will will hopefully tell them something about themselves. That would be useful to get measures that can sort of point to us that something's going on, right? Because secretly we sort of know, but we don't want to admit it. So it's nice if, if we can get better at, at detecting that and then interve intervening. Um, mm. There's still more questions in the chat, but we'll, we'll have some time after the recording. I want to give the floor back to Anna. Hey, so I'm just gonna squeeze in one quick question before we finish the recording. Um, if we kind of think about this sort of Fitbit for the brain idea, what we see with a lot of technologies that are used in work, and I guess even when we think about that example you were talking about that was in the press, about an employer giving employees um, these sorts of technologies, often the employer has access to the data. And, and we saw like this, you know, a bit of a reaction to that, I think during the pandemic when um, some companies started to, to attract their employees a lot more. And, and I kind of wondered what your thoughts are about that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's, there's definitely first of all, it's worth separating out general annoyance of being tracked by an employer, because I think there's, there's lots of people who work in environments where that happens, like um, drivers get tracked a lot on their performance. And that's uh, something that they find annoying, I guess, a lot of the time in general. And Amazon employees, as far as I understand, also uh, in, the, in the factories, packing factories also experience this kind of annoyance with being tracked. Um, and you're right, I think I've seen you post a lot about it during the pandemic, that people feel more, more watched and more tracked because they're being remote. And that's a challenge. But we've, we have spoken to some people about this and people do find specifically the idea that their mental workload or their inner thought processes to some extent being tracked is how, somehow a much bigger invasion of privacy than, um, than just being observed like how much they walk. <laughs> um, so it has been interesting the, the rate that people, so that they say things like they, they, can, they can manage their game face when they're at work. So even inside they might be like, ah! they, they, they've got this like, calm outside to them which they feel like they're presenting to the to the office and so they don't want this like internal sense of maybe they're panicking or you know struggling with something to be revealed when they should be able to control how they how they achieve things and you know maybe manage the extra time in their own they're worried uh, lots of people are worried about knock-on consequence like will it will it be used in uh performance reviews you know you seem to be not working very hard all the time or you seem to be working really hard on something that's so trivial um, so this consequence down the road is the unknown they're worried about. Yeah. Um, we haven't had some people say that it would be quite good, actually, that maybe it would remove other biases if they could see directly into how well they can do their job. Um, so they can remove assumptions based on you know, random prejudices. Yeah, I think I just imagine that if an employer could see that you didn't find any of your work high load, they think they could give you more, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> so what we, what I'm focusing on, what I'm trying to focus on is it, calling it personal data, brain data is personal data. Because um, I think this is what people should be able to do. Like we found something quite interesting in a, in a local car manufacturing company we went to visit. And they very much do track themselves in order to use that data to argue against management. So one of them felt their job was much harder than everyone else's. And so they were tracking data about themselves to use that to show people. Um, but they were really resistant in a unionized kind of way to being tracked by the employer about how they were doing their job. So I think this difference is going to be even more critical for, you know, internal mental yeah. workload efforts. Yeah, because if it's personal, it could be empowering. Mm. But if it's given away, it's like an invasion of privacy and, and undermines uh, lots of your autonomy, I think. Okay, so um, I guess uh, we should take this opportunity to thank you very much for a really interesting discussion. I have lots of ideas after this. Um, uh, for those of you that aren't following us yet, yet on Twitter, please do that. And we'll stick the link to Twitter in the chat in a moment. And uh, 
just a quick reminder that next week we have Ben Cohen from the University College Dublin talking about a social talk, proactive agents and the future of work. So we'll stop the recording now and open the conversation.